here in First Corinthians 3, we come to a new chapter. I'll just read the beginning of the chapter. And I, brethren, have not been able to speak to you as to spiritual, but as to fleshly, as to babes in Christ. I have given you milk to drink, not meat, for ye have not yet been able, nor indeed are you yet able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there are among you emulation and strife, are you not carnal, and walk according to man? <clears throat> Here we see, first of all, a connection with the preceding chapters. Um, in chapter 2, Paul had said um, about coming to them, the Corinthians, I came to you, brethren, not in excellency of word. So there's a connection with chapter 2. But there is also a connection with the theme that he developed at the end of chapter 2 when he spoke about uh, the need to be spiritually minded. There he distinct, distinguished between the natural man who does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, verse 14 of chapter 2, and the spiritual man who has received the Spirit of God, the believer, in the right condition, who receives the thoughts of God. But here in chapter 3 he mentions a different category, and that is fleshly or carnal. So they were believers... So they were not longer seen as natural men, but they were not really spiritual either. There was a lack in their spiritual condition, and that's indicated by the word fleshly. Fleshly is um, led by the flesh, or under the control of the flesh. And in verse 3, he uses the word carnal. is very closely in, related in the Greek, only one letter difference. Um, in verse 1, there was a lack of maturity, but in verse 3, when he says, For ye are yet carnal, there is a persistence in this attitude, so there is kind of hardening. That word for carnal is used seven times in the New Testament, and it refers to the spiritual condition of the believer who is not only immature, but persists in this carnal attitude. And so Paul had to deal with the believers in Corinth as babes or infants, literally, infants in Christ. So they were in Christ, but they were infants. Now, it's not wrong to be an infant. It's not wrong to be a babe. But there's a problem when one wants to remain a babe, when one does not want to grow. That is where the problem comes. And then... We have also the danger that the enemy would influence the believers. In Ephesians 4, Paul explains the need for spiritual growth so that the enemy cannot sway and toss them around through all kinds of wind of doctrine. So the need for spiritual growth is evident. And also in Galatians we see the need for spiritual growth and Paul's desire was that Christ would be uh, produced in them, in the believers. So the need for spiritual growth is obvious, and that is what Paul indicates here. Now it's not wrong, I repeat, to be a babe. A babe in Christ, an infant in Christ, can have the right spiritual attitude, and we saw that in chapter 2, when Paul said in verse 6, but we speak wisdom among the perfect. And then we discussed that attitude the right spiritual attitude and then it doesn't matter whether you're a babe or a young man in Christ or a father in Christ what matters is the right spiritual uh, attitude and then growth will come by itself the Spirit of God will make sure that there will be progress but here there was a hindrance for progress and so Paul was limited in what he could share with them. In verse 2 he says, I have given you milk to drink. Again, that's not wrong in itself. But if it keeps, um, if, the, if the believer only wants milk to drink and nothing else, then there's a problem. So I repeat, the milk of the word is good. The word is so wonderful, it's compared with many different resources that we can take in. And one of those resources is milk, as you find in Deuteronomy 8 already and many other scriptures, in Psalm 119, 
So the milk, there's no problem with the milk. The problem was with the condition of the believers. And in First Peter 2, we see how, an import, how important it is that we would have the desire, the milk of the word, because then we can grow. If the desire is there, the eagerness to take in, then we will grow. The word will make sure that we will grow. But here there was an obstacle for spiritual growth because of their carnal condition. And so they were not able to grow, they were not able to take in the meat of the word. And this is what Paul addresses in verse 2. And he says even, indeed you are not yet able. So he indicates there this persistence in their carnal attitude. And he elaborates that in verse 3. For whereas there are among you emulation and strife, or um, this uh, envying, the, the, these different forms of jealousy that were there, as we have seen already in chapter 1, and that led to strife, all kind of um, quarrels, that was the evidence of their carnal condition. And not only that, they were walking according to man. Um, so that is the concept that they had uh, of being Christians, they were Christians but in a carnal condition and they were walking according to man's standards. And Paul addressed that already in chapter 1 and he uh, addresses that here again. And this was what characterized them, they were walking in this. And then he elaborates that in verse 4, what, what they were doing. So verse 4 substantiates what he mentioned here in verse 3. There were these divisions, uh, jealousy, strife, and that is then uh, elaborated by him in verse 4. They were saying, I am of Paul, the other said, I am of Apollos, and we discussed that in chapter 1. But then, <clears throat> Paul explained in verse 5, who then is Apollos and who is Paul? And so now he's going to give in seven points what... Paul did what Apollos had done and what God had done through them. First of all, Apollos and Paul were ministering servants, literally deacons. They were um, servants. And the King James has ministers, but it does not mean that they were just like a reverend there. No, they were serving the people of God as true deacons. Later on, Paul uses the word laborer in verse 9, one who works hard. And in chapter 4, uh, he calls himself um, a minister, but that's a different word in the Greek, an attendant, someone who takes care of God's interest. So Paul was a servant in many different capacities. If you would study Acts 20, you find a list of 20 or 21 different points that Paul brings out what he was doing among the believers there in Ephesus during those three years as a servant of God. So the idea of servant has many different aspects and that applies to us also, of course. So the first point is Paul and Apollos were servants. The second point is that through them God gave the increase. So in verse 6 Paul elaborates on this that um, the Lord has given them to each. So, and Paul and Apollos had been given to the believers. That's the second point. The third point is in verse 6 that Paul had planted, Apollos had watered. So there was a difference in ministry compared between Paul and Apollos. But the point is that they had been working together, planted, watered. And the fourth point is God has given the increase. The servant couldn't do that. Only God could give the increase. And that is a very important point. And so the conclusion of this point is in verse 7, so that neither the planter is anything, nor the waterer, but God, the giver of the increase. And then all glory goes to God, not to man. But then the next point is in verse 8, that the laborers are working together. There is one plan. Yes, there is diversity in function, in ministry, 
but there is unity, there is a plan, and that is in verse 8. But the planter and the water are one. And then Paul brings out another point, that <clears throat> they would each one receive a reward, but each shall receive his own reward. So there is this unity in concept, unity uh, of plan and purpose, but yet there is a difference. There are different servants, different ministries, and according to their own labor they will be rewarded. Here the word labor implies hard work. Paul was working hard, and he uh, mentioned that in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, for example. He was working very hard, and that's also a lesson for us to really work hard, not for our own interest, but for, but for God's interest. So the sixth point is that they will have a reward according to their own labor, their own hard work. And then the seventh point is the conclusion in verse 9, for we are God's fellow workmen. So Apollos, Apollos and Paul and also Cephas and others who were working in God's vineyard, they were together fellow workmen. They were not competing with each other, but they were working together as fellow workmen. But to whom did they belong? To God. This flock belonged to God. The house, as we'll see, belonged to God. The field belongs to God. The family belongs to God. And so after these seven points, I just want to mention that also um, we have three main concepts in this chapter. The first concept is of a family. Family, we see parents and children, and there is uh, care for each other. The parents care for the children, like Paul, as a spiritual father, cared for these believers in Corinth, and he was very much concerned about their spiritual well-being and uh, about their growth. So there we have the family, and there you have to have the right kind of food. But then, <clears throat> when we have seen in the middle of um, this discussion about planting and giving water, then we have the field. Paul was also a farmer who was working on a field very diligently. And he mentioned that God had given the increase. So there we are on the field, and there God wants to produce. He wants fruits. So that is another concept. So the laborer is like in a family. The laborer is seen on the field as a hard-working servant. But then when we go further in verse 9, we see that Paul switches to the concept of a building. That is not very strange. Often in Scripture, the field and the building are closely connected. And here is just an example of that, that Paul speaks about the field, God's interest in connection with the field, and then all of a sudden he speaks about God's interest in connection with the building. And God dwells in this building. And there the emphasis will be on what kind of standards God wants to apply. Uh, he wants good quality. And the building is does belong to God. The Corinthians, they were emphasizing their own interests and they were seeing only their own uh, ideas. But now Paul uh, brings to their attention the point that they together form God's building. So that's all the believers in a locality form this building, this dwelling. And it's interesting that in the Old Testament the tabernacle was seen like a dwelling, the dwelling where God dwelt among his people and so here we have God's building there in Corinth God's dwelling among the Gentiles and so this is God's building also today every individual believer is a building for God that's developed elsewhere in chapter 6 but also the believers together locally form a building as we have here and we have also the concept in Ephesians 2 that all the believers together form one building. And when the, the rapture will take place, then this building will be there, and that is a lasting concept, as we have also in Revelation, so that we could study about God's building. But it is God's building. 
and the servants were God's servants. Now in connection with the building, Paul says in verse 10, according to the grace of God. And that's a beautiful expression repeated seven times in Paul's writings about the grace of God. It was the grace of God that <clears throat> saved him. It was the grace of God that made him a servant. It was the grace of God that gave him this wisdom to be like a wise architect, a master builder. And God is the wise God, so wisdom comes from God. God is the builder, <coughs> God gives the wisdom, God is also the farmer, as we've seen earlier, and now God is the builder, but he implies servants like Paul, and what was very special in Corinthians Paul, that the foundation for the building can only be laid once. We do not start with building a roof, we start with the foundation. And that foundation can only be laid once. That's the point in verse 10. Paul had laid that foundation. And no one else can lay a foundation like that, because Christ is the foundation. And verse 11 shows that. It's only uh, built once. Also in our lives, when we become a believer, then God lays the foundation and he puts on us on that right foundation, who is, which is Jesus Christ. Now Paul had laid that foundation in that community in Corinth, and he had received this wisdom from God to do that. But then he emphasizes also man's responsibility. God does one thing, and then he implies his people on the other hand, and the two go together. We cannot always explain how this is, but we see in this one verse that God gave the wisdom to Paul to lay the foundation, but then at the same time, let each one see how he builds upon it. It shows man's responsibility. Paul was responsible as a laborer, but also every believer is responsible how he would proceed uh, and how he would build on that foundation that has been laid once and for all. So this is a test. We have seen earlier that the Corinthians were following man's ideas, walking as man, walking according to man's standards, but now they had to learn to see what really important is following God's principles, following God's standards. And that is the responsibility that Paul points out here. How we are building on that one foundation, and the foundation is Jesus Christ. It is not a philosophy, it's a person, the Lord Jesus, the one who died and rose again. He is the person who is that foundation, Jesus Christ. This beautiful name that we find already in the Gospel of uh, Matthew, Yeshua, Jesus is Jehovah, is salvation, and he is also God's anointed. Now he is anointed in heaven, and he is the one who forms that foundation on which we can build. And so the responsibility of man is then uh, pointed out in verse 12. Now if anyone built upon this foundation, and then there are two categories. There are good materials and there are bad materials. So you have to have the right foundation, Jesus Christ. You have the right uh, concept, as we saw earlier, the right plan. But now we come also to the right materials, the right motives. And here we see how gold, silver and precious stones are the materials that are put on that foundation. And here we see a variety in the believers, but also perhaps a variety in aspect. The believers are seen here in three different ways. They are seen as pure gold. That is the gold that comes from God. God is magnified in the gold. Often the Old Testament shows that the gold speaks of the glory of God. And so in the believers there in Corinth, you see gold. God had made them gold, gold for his house. You see them also as silver. God had redeemed them through the price of the redemption. The silver was used in the Old Testament to pay the price of redemption, but the Lord Jesus 
in his work of redemption is really that silver and now the believers are seen as a result of his work of redemption as silver that God has bought and they are precious as silver for him, for his house and they are also precious stones because the Holy Spirit was dwelling in them and the Holy Spirit was working in each one in a different way precious stones, plural, every believer is different but God likes to see them this way as precious stones the precious stones reflect something of the beauties of Christ the precious stones are precious for God but they are also precious for the Lord Jesus and now Paul sees them as precious he sees those believers who were so uh, failing in themselves but he sees them from God's perspective as precious stones so we have also the thought of the Trinity God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is involved in these materials in the gold, silver and precious stones but then we see how easily man's concept can come in by bringing wrong materials by bringing wood, grass and straw and so that would indicate then that believers are brought on that foundation who are failing or that people are brought on that foundation who are not even saved and so the wood cannot stand the fire in verse 13 he explains that the work of each shall be made manifest so every builder who is building on that foundation so it's not a farmer now but it is a builder who is working here and how is he working he puts materials on that foundation to build that house and that work will be examined the work of each one God was at work as we have seen earlier Paul was at work but now also every believer is at work and how is he working? is he bringing wood, grass and straw? is he bringing believers but he brings them with wrong doctrines? all that is um, wrong will be eliminated ultimately but the time for that elimination has not come the time of judgment is future but what God wants us to do is examine things in his light and see the things from his perspective so that we will not try to bring wrong materials but that we will try to bring the good the right materials who will, can, who will stand the test of the fire the fire speaks of God's holiness and so God wants us to apply that test already now that we are re really honoring his, uh, his holiness, honoring his rights, so that we will not dare to bring wrong materials to his house. And it is obvious that every work will be tested and will be manifested. That is the judgment seat of Christ, Second Corinthians 5, verse 10, and the judgment seat of God, Romans 14, verse 10 and then the day the day is here a reference to the day of manifestation the day shall declare it so that's a very solemn concept that everything will be revealed but I think Paul's exercise was to walk in the light of that coming day so that he would evaluate these things from God's perspective right now and there and that is the challenge for us also to see the things from God's perspective not wait not to wait till that day but to see the things in the light of that day that takes faith and this is what we see with Paul and also um, we realize that everything will be revealed and so now we want to walk already in that light in that light of the coming day we want to see the things from God's perspective because we know everything will be revealed if we try to hide wrong quality or wrong uh, purpose or wrong doing whatever it is we are fooling ourselves and so may we uh, help each other to walk in the light of that coming day and we know that that fire will test will put to the test everything there's an interesting word that Paul uses here in verse 14 um, in verse 13, 14 and 15 that fire shall test verse 13 every man's work so it is uh, put to the test and then 
it will be declared, it will be revealed what kind of material it is, what kind of work it is. And the evidence is in verse 14, if any man's work abide, which is built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So God will give a reward, if we saw earlier already, according to man's labor. But if, verse 15, man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. The believer will not perish, but the wrong materials, the wrong materials, or whatever he did wrong, that will disappear in the fire. So we have the worker who works according to God's plan, with the right motives, with the right materials, like Paul, or we have workers who are believers, but who use the wrong concept or the wrong materials, the wrong motives. God will take care of that. But when we come to verse 16, we find a third category in this chapter, and that is very solemn, because there we have the concept of unbelievers who are involved in this building. You wonder, how is that possible? Yes, that is possible. In the day of man in which we live, this kind of mixture is possible. And the Lord had foreseen that already in the parables in the Gospels. But before we elaborate on that, let us just see verse 16. Know ye not. Know ye not. I think that is a question Paul asks ten times in this epistle. It shows man's responsibility. We should know. Know ye not. Here it is. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, or temple of God. So here the believers are seen as this one house. The house of God is one building, but the building now is called temple of God. Why is that? Because here the emphasis is on what is for God's pleasure, God's delight, God's um, purpose also, and also that he would be served in that temple. And so... The Spirit of God dwells in us, in the believers. Um, it's not a contradiction. God is in the temple, but everything is now through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in this temple, but the Holy Spirit is God. And so, here the emphasis on the Spirit, and we saw that earlier with the materials, with the gold, the silver, and precious stones. Perhaps with the precious stones we see a very special emphasis on the Holy Spirit, who produces uh, different qualities of Christ in the believers, so that he makes the believers to reflect something of God's qualities. And now here we see this house, that it is the temple of the living God, the temple of the Spirit of God who dwells there in you can also be read as among you and so the Holy Spirit is in each believer individually but he's also in the believers as a group as a local assembly but also dwells among us he's active there he's working among us and then Paul elaborates the responsibility of man again in verse 17 if any man defile the temple of God that's a very solemn thought, to defile. Here the word defile is really closely related to the word corruption, what is corruptible or what is corrupt. And so there's a close connection between defilement and corruption. And then the ultimate uh, concept is, or the ultimate consequence is, if someone corrupts or defiles the temple of God, he himself will be corrupted. And that means... Um, destroyed, as the King James says. It is very solemn. Uh, God's government, we see God's government and also man's responsibility. If we try to affect God's work, God is not careless about that. God will take care and he will ultimately deal with that. And why? Because he is holy. And so are ye. So Paul shows that the temple of God is a holy place and that the believers who are the ye, that is the believers, are holy. But yet the ye here may imply the idea that there are also unbelievers among them. 
Of course, that is not an eternal concept, that is for the time being, where we have man's responsibility that even in this holy place there can be unbelievers. That is man's mixture. This mixture is not of God, of course. But the believers are seen as holy, set apart for God. Not uh, that we are any special in ourselves, but God has made us holy, God has set us apart for himself, and so God has made us to be in tune with himself, who is holy. But man's responsibility is emphasized again in verse 18, let no man deceive himself. That easily happens. Um, you can kid yourself, you can try to kid God, but God cannot be deceived. We can deceive others, but God, God cannot be deceived. And so that is a solemn reminder of the people who try to uh, walk according to man's concept or to please man. If we try to please man or self, we are really deceiving ourselves. And that is very solemn. God doesn't want us to deceive anyone. He wants us to be in the light, to walk in the light, to walk according to this holiness that we just saw, and not according to man's standards. If any man among you seems to be wise, or thinks, he has this concept, this idea, this thinking, that he is wise. But we've seen earlier already, the wisdom comes from God. And you cannot mix the wisdom of man with the wisdom of God. But that was the problem in Corinth. They tried to mix the wisdom of God with the wisdom of this world. Man's wisdom. So if you are really wise, then you apply God's standards. And so Paul says it in a very special way here in verse 18. If any man among you seems or thinks to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So you take a place that the world would ridicule you, that the world thinks, thinks you are a fool, but then you are really wise from God's perspective. So that is the uh, challenge that is placed before every believer, not to promote man's thinking, but to be on the line of God's concept, of God's ideas, of God's wisdom. And that implies uh, self-judgment, it implies to be humble, it implies this seeming contradiction of wise and fool. In verse 19 he explains it in more detail, what we are according to God's wisdom. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. We saw that in chapter 1 already, that the wisdom uh, of uh, man cannot reach God's, God's wisdom. They have not seen the wisdom of God nor the power of God. And God's wisdom is foolishness for them. But now, the other side of the coin is the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Here it is the wisdom of cosmos. In chapter 1 it was the wisdom of this age. And so whether you see the world of a united system as a cosmos or you see the world as this Ion, this time frame which is under the control of the uh, God of this age, in both cases it is really foolishness with God. That is God's concept of this world. And he bases that on a verse in the Old Testament, for it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. And that's a quote from the bo book of Job. That doesn't mean that Job's friends who were talking to him were really right with God. We know from the concept, from the context in Job, that these friends were not really right with God. Neither was Job, although Job was closer to God than his friends were. But the point is that what this uh, friend stated is something that the Holy Spirit can use now in this argument, that God takes the wise in his own craftiness. Man seems to be so wise and God takes him in his own craftiness. Illustration, Pharaoh, Pharaoh thought that he was wise, wiser than God, he resisted God, and God caught him in his own craftiness. He had then this plan to go after the Israelites, after 
the Passover lamb, after they had left Egypt, he went after them in his own craftiness to catch them. And then God caught him in this net of his own craftiness, and he perished. So this is very solemn if we try to challenge God, as Pharaoh did, and as the wise of this world do. Whether it is the evolutionists or other forms of human wisdom, they are really digging their own grave. And in verse 20, again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. This is God's evaluation. That ultimately, all the thinking, all the plans, all the actions of man in his own wisdom, apart from God or against God, it is really vanity, as you find in the book of Ecclesiastes. Conclusion, verse 21, Therefore let no man glory in man. And that should be a lesson for all of us. We have a tendency to put men on a pedestal, if it's not ourselves, somebody else. But therefore let no man glory in man. Let us not put anyone on a pedestal, because we have to see the things from God's perspective, as we saw earlier, and glory in God. And then it's a very striking point that Paul makes here, to see the things from God's perspective and what we have received from God instead of boasting against Paul or against Apollos or uh, competing uh, among each other or striving Paul says let's look at now from God's perspective you everything belongs to you so don't make a difference between Paul and Apollos D don't try to put the one against the other and Paul and Apollos, and Cephas, is another name for Peter, the Apostle Peter, we saw in chapter 1 already, they were gifts that God had given to the believers. And even this world, whatever we have in this world, it is a gift of God. Or life, or death, he will see that uh, God is going to use death as a servant for the believers. When Stephen was stoned to death, we see that he slept, and the Lord took care of him. So whatever happens, God gives everything to the believer, things present or things future, it's all yours, Paul says. All these things belong to you. And so see the things from this perspective, that we receive all these things from God. Don't try to put yourself uh, up for Paul and against Apollos, see how both are a gift of God to us. And then the other side of the coin is in verse 23, ye are Christ, ye belong to Christ, ye belong, you are his, his belonging. And then Christ is God's. So this is a wonderful concept that everything comes from God, that now we belong to Christ, but also Christ is seen as the one who belongs to God. Here is Christ seen as a man, even there in the glory, where he crowned with honor and glory, he is of God, he belongs to God. And so maybe we have this concept uh, that Paul brings out here in chapter 3, this wonderful unity of God's plan, the unity of the family, the field that produces something for God's honor, even in this world, some, there is a field that is for God, and there is then this building that belongs to God, where God's standards are acknowledged, God's thoughts are honored. And then we see this wonderful conclusion, we belong to God, we belong to Christ. And that is then connected in chapter 4, and we hope to see the next time, with the matter of accountability, stewardship. Paul shows there that we are stewards. So we've seen that... Not only Paul is a servant, we are all servants. But that brings then the matter of responsibility and accountability in chapter 4. We all have to give an account, but that we'll have to keep to the next time, God willing. May the, God, may the Lord bless his word.